lecture from the, from the Stanford Medicine uh, Center for Improvement Lecture Series. Um, we're very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Sam Kling and Stacy Villandrer to uh, discuss their topic on did it work telemedicine in acute care uh, setting during COVID using mixed methods to evaluate hospital transformation in real time. Um, Sam is a transdisciplinary healthcare re uh, researcher and dietitian with expertise in implementation science, childhood nutrition, eating, uh, digestive, ingestive behavior innovations in clinical and community healthcare, and obesity prevention and treatment. Uh, Stacy is a practicing family physician, serves as medical director of the Evaluation Sciences Unit within the Division of Primary Care and Population Health here at Stanford. She's completed her MD MBA at Stanford residency in family medicine at UCSF affiliate Santa Rosa Family Medicine and the Stanford Intermountain Fellowship in Population Health and Delivery Science. Stacy uses mixed methodologies and implementation science to study diverse topics such as clinician incentive and feedback design, social determinants of health, and how to effectively incorporate emerging technologies into clinical practice. Um, so uh, Stacy or Sam, I'm not sure who's going to go first, but maybe I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> start the presentation. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And so just give me a moment to do that. And we'll put it in presentation mode. All right. So um, I'm not going to look at the chat during it, but we'll certainly have time for discussion at the end. Um, so and Paul, if, if you see something in chat in the chat and want to interrupt us, feel free. Um, this is certainly more of just a, a conversation um, presentation and then hopefully conversation at the end. Uh, so good morning. I'm, I'm Stacy Blender. Um, we are presenting today, as Paul mentioned, uh, a, a mixed methods evaluation of telemedicine in the acute care setting. And so we'll be talking about uh, learning health systems. Uh, what is the definition? How can we integrate quality improvement and evaluation science uh, together to improve Stanford Medicine as a whole uh, towards becoming a learning health system. Uh, we'll take you back to COVID-19 and the redawn of telemedicine, uh, those, those early days and, and what happened to make telemedicine so ubiquitously used. Um, and then we'll look at this embedded research agenda. We put forth five different projects culminating in five papers uh, several colleagues contributed to this. Um, and so we'll talk through each one of these. And the point is really not, uh, this is not a research talk, although we'll be talking about the research. The point for you really is to understand how, how can we uh, go about answering a question and what do we think about as researchers to, to do that? And then how can we work with um, you know, quality improvement to, to make those, make recommendations for improvement and actually implement them. Um, so we'll uh, be evaluating ourselves uh, lessons learned um, in that regard, and then hopefully have room for discussion. Uh, we have no conflicts of interest to report and our views are our own. And uh, I'm excited to share that our work in the emergency department, uh, led by Birju Patel, who is a clinical informatics fellow here, uh, won an award through the SMCI for uh, best publication focused on an adult population. So uh, that was a real honor. And I certainly encourage uh, everyone to submit their papers, their ongoing work uh, to the SMCI proposal as, as that comes up. I think they do it uh, once a year. So the, pro the work I'm about to talk about was really truly an interdisciplinary and interinstitutional effort. And I will also add, um, I didn't know how to say this in words, but at, at, with people at different levels of training, um, at different stages in their career. So we worked with Stanford Children's Health, uh, uh, input from the clinical informatics department um, and Stanford, uh, sorry, and the Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, we have our colleagues from the Office of Research uh, in Nursing and Patient Care Services. Uh, there were undergrads and graduate students involved in this work through uh, Lisa Shea's um, leadership through the Stanford Health Consulting Group. Of course, my colleagues at the evaluation sciences unit uh, within the Department of Medicine. Our group, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a group of mixed methods, researchers, masters, PhD level um, clinicians who uh, specialize in health services, research, and evaluation sciences. 
Um, we had support from the ICDP, the Improvement Capability, Capability Development Program within Stanford Healthcare. Um, and we also uh, linked up with the County of Santa Clara Health System. Uh, so just could not have been done without these people. What is a learning health system? There are all kinds of definitions out there, uh, but this Institute of Medicine definition is probably the most commonly used. Learning health systems are health systems in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the delivery process and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the delivery experience. And I read that out loud uh, just so that we can all kind of sit with it and measure ourselves and our day-to-day -day work against this definition. How well are we doing uh, to really promote Stanford Medicine as a whole um, and, and support outside health systems through, through the dissemination of knowledge? Um, how well are we doing that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? And I invite you to judge us during this talk um, and uh, how well we integrated, and I bolded, science, informatics, incentives, and culture. And we'll revisit this at the end uh, of the talk as well. How can we integrate quality improvement and embedded research? And this is a model that my colleagues uh, over at the ESU uh, and, and David Larson contributed to as well. Uh, that we've come up with, and this is uh, still a work in progress, uh, but we sort of see the quality improvement team as uh, charged with primarily solving the problem. Uh, we have a problem in the healthcare system, we need to fix it, how can we do that? The embedded researchers are charged with uh, pursuing the truth. And uh, so what did we learn from that process that is true? And we, each groups have different uh, tools at their disposal for that. Um, and just to describe this Venn diagram, so you have a problem in the healthcare system, you're trying to solve it. So you're gonna do a pre-intervention root cause analysis. There's some sort of intervention and then there's this post-intervention evaluation. So how well did we do? Uh, so the tools at our disposal. Uh, so more on the quality improvement side, uh, we have A3s, which is a very structured way to think about a problem. Uh, Plan, do, study, act, PDSA cycles. Uh, they uh, design and deploy the intervention. Uh, and then usually the analysis comes in the form of run charts. Uh, so it's often a pre and post looking at the data before and after the intervention. Um, when you bring in an embedded researchers, uh, they can certainly support with those efforts, uh, but they bring a slightly different dimension. Um, we really like to get involved up front. Um, so that blue circle on the left lower side of the, of the slide here, we like to identify comparison groups and appropriate outcomes. And that's usually best done at the outset of an intervention. On the back end, there is all kinds of work with data collection, analysis, interpretation. Uh, we can use mixed methods, data collection and analysis as well. So incorporating uh, the quantitative data, which is what people usually think of first, but also the qualitative interviews, getting in there and talking to people and uh, uh, using methodologies to evaluate what we learned from those interviews. And then finally, uh, really sharing what we've learned. So creating those academic products uh, that are disseminated more broadly. So kind of with that lens or that framework, we're gonna take you through uh, an embedded research case study looking at telemedicine in the acute care setting as an infection control measure during COVID-19. So this probably was nobody's favorite time back in March of 2020, uh, but COVID-19 removed a lot of the traditional barriers to telemedicine. The emergency was declared and we saw, we started to see full parity and reimbursement, lifting of interstate practice restrictions, uh, we, they waived the need for a pre-existing patient provider relationship uh, in order to offer telemedicine. And then new platforms were allowed, uh, Zoom, WebEx, and FaceTime, uh, to name uh, the, the dominant ones um, that people uh, took up. Uh, so we saw this just huge adoption of telemedicine in all kinds of new ways. Now, telemedicine historically, prior to COVID-19, was predominantly focused on helping people access care in remote settings. So you, this, you can think of 
uh, a remote community hospital with maybe just a hospitalist on staff getting advice from a remote, uh, an intensivist located in a remote setting. Um, and so this was, you know, well established for decades. Uh, but with COVID-19, we saw it as an infection control measure. Uh, and so when you look at it for that use case, there really wasn't that much out there at the start of COVID-19. Uh, we, you know, I remember sitting up late, you know, thinking about these different issues as, as we were all kind of beginning the lockdown um, and finding a, a couple papers, one on Ebola in Sierra Leone, you know, people starting to use it for that. There was a system developed. Um, and then some other people kind of saying, you know, we could use this for MERS, for SARS, for these various uh, uh, infectious disease settings. Uh, but it really, really, there wasn't that much out there. And just to underscore this point, the very definitions of telemedicine and telehealth uh, that the federal government uses have within them distance site and long distance. And this really, the, the use in the inpatient acute care setting is really not that. Um, it's actually potentially on the other side of the door. So uh, here's Adele singing hello from the other side of the door. So in the uh, in the wards, you really have people just down the hall or just on the other side of the door um, connecting with patients who are under isolation precautions in the room. And understanding the dynamics of that was really uh, a wide open field. You might remember we were uh, very short electronic, or sorry, very short uh, personal protective equipment not that long ago. This was a, a, a very pressing need. And could we use telemedicine as electronic PPE? So every time you prevent someone going into the room, presumably that is one less PPE unit that they do not have to use. Uh, and, and so we have more resources available for that. What was going on at home? Uh, Stanford Healthcare, I'm, I'm proud to say uh, that we were very quick to respond. Um, within the middle of March, we had tablets on wheels um, in the emergency department. And by mid-April, we had over 400 tablets covering all inpatient and emergency areas. And I think this is a uh, credit, uh, this, similar things were also going on at Stanford Children's Health as well. And this is a credit to um, uh, Dr. Christopher Sharp and Natalie Padular uh, and their teams, uh, Rajiv Ramdeo, this is his photo um, on the Stanford healthcare side uh, for just rolling this out. This was uh, very impressive. So to take you through these five projects, that I mentioned, uh, we really started by simply describing what was happening. Uh, and this was uh, looking at this rapid deployment of inpatient, uh, the telemedicine response across three health systems. So we talked to our neighbors, you might recognize the Stanford healthcare, Stanford on the adult side, the children's logo and the County of Santa Clara um, that, uh, so we really, the great thing about this uh, was that each health system rolled it out in a slightly different way. So we were really able to share uh, with the broader uh, informatics community what the different trade-offs were of that. And we didn't plan this, but each of these systems used a different platform. So we saw Zoom, we saw WebEx, we saw FaceTime. Um, and this has changed since then, uh, but this was, you know, at the first outset, what were we doing to just roll this um, technology out to get ready for this, uh, to, to be prepared for this pandemic. Um, just one of the in differences that were that was interesting was uh, just the patient privacy. Uh, so if you think about physically, if you're in the inpatient setting, uh, typically I think most clinicians give a little knock on the door before they walk into the room and, and kind of say, hello, how are you doing? Uh, in with the telemedicine, that's not always possible. So on the Stanford healthcare side, a lot of times they would call the patient on the phone and say, hey, I'm about to call you on the Zoom. Can you, you know, position it correctly or, or just get ready for this phone call? Uh, on the WebEx and FaceTime for, for those platforms, um, they, the patient actually got to say, yes, I accept or no, I decline this call. Um, so there, there were a little bit of challenges with that, um, but just, you know, considering it from the patient perspective, what, what does that feel like? What does that look like? So with that initial paper, what did we learn? We learned that it was feasible. 
it's feasible in these in the, for this different use case of infection control. Uh, we got our hands on utilization data at SHC um, and saw a positive adoption, uh, which is great. So this had impl implications around, uh, you know what, we can actually use telemedicine in infection control settings. There's something here. There is this potential to reduce infections, reduce PPE use. Maybe there's a benefit to medical education. Uh, I think the policy at the time was medical students uh, were not allowed in, in COVID-19 patients' rooms. Um, so could they join and have an educational experience through a virtual setting? Um, and what about future opportunities for non-COVID care? Uh, so things like anytime a patient is under isolation precautions, so stem cell transplants, um, I guess other types of transplants where the immune system is compromised, other infectious uh, diseases and so forth. Okay, so we, we got that paper out there, we're using this, but did it work? And so when you're trying to answer this question, you have to say, well, did it work at what? What were we even trying to do here? Well, I think uh, the intended effects of this deployment of inpatient telemedicine was to reduce infections and reduce the units of PPE used. Uh, and so to evaluate that, you know, theoretically, if you use telemedicine, you're not gonna go into the room and therefore there's no potential exposure and there's no PPE unit used. What things were, what, how you think things are gonna work in theory versus how they work in real world settings. Um, and so really getting that data and understanding uh, will be of use. And then any secondary effects, and these could be positive or negative. And so was it acceptable to patients, clinicians? Uh, how was it integrated into clinical workflows? What was the impact on team dynamics? How did it impact patient safety? And then how much time did it save in terms of donning and doffing PPE? Uh, there is evidence out there that it takes four minutes to properly put on all the components of PPE and three minutes to actually doff or remove uh, those PPE units. And so if you're not going into the room, maybe there are some time savings there. So how do we answer these questions? What data is available? Really uh, to look at infection uh, and, and infections of health staff workers, you ideally you'd look at occupational health data. Well, at the time that uh, that data was just too sensitive to use, we would essentially be, we were essentially asking, hey, can I see, you know, the colleagues, my colleagues that got sick from, from COVID-19. Um, and it was also noisy because people could have gotten it from the community and so forth. Uh, so that wasn't what we used. Uh, what about PPE inventory? Well, it's not perfectly tracked. Uh, you're not, it's very resource intensive to have somebody observe and, and be there all day and all night on the wards to see how much is being used. So that wasn't really an option for us, but we did have this location data. Uh, so this is the real-time locating system data. So RTLS, uh, which Sam will talk about in a moment, uh, but this essentially workers use, they, they wear a badge and as they enter a room, there is a sensor in the room that puts a time, a room and timestamp. Um, so like lo location and, and time, um, and that data can be used as a proxy for infection exposure and PPE use. Uh, so that it was, it was interesting. Um, so we started to look into that. Was it acceptable to patients in the clinical team? We uh, could certainly conduct interviews and that's exactly what we did. Uh, in terms of patient safety, could we also use the location data to start to maybe draw some early conclusions about patient safety? Uh, we know that there's a link between nursing time spent at the patient's bedside and patient safety. And so, uh, and, and nurses are actually trained to check in on a patient once every hour, at least once every hour. And with those practices, we know that adverse uh, patient safety events decrease. And so what does that mean in terms of nurses entering the room in terms of patient safety? Um, and if they have this telemedicine equipment or telemedicine technology available, um, what is that going to look like in terms of downstream effects on patient safety? Um, and then finally, and really for patient safety, you want to look at length of stay, morbidity, mortality, uh, adverse events. Um, the data set that we had, there were those, were those outcomes were just too small in quantity. 
Um, and there were also too many variables to really draw conclusions about that. So we, we didn't end up pursuing that um, with this, this effort. Oh, and what should we call it? Uh, we, uh, and I actually can't read it because my Zoom thing is blocking it, but um, should I know because we spent a long time with the various teams discussing this because it wasn't well established in the literature, should we call it inpatient telehealth, telemedicine, virtual rounding, electronic PPE? Um, so there was a lot of debate around that. Um, and I think we've landed on inpatient telehealth uh, and telemedicine, <laughs> kind of both. Uh, so um, so that's, that's kind of, it's still ongoing, ongoing debate in the literature. I wanna just touch on implementation science. Uh, this is a lot of what we do in uh, my res or our research group over at the Evaluation Sciences Unit. And uh, this is one of the most common frameworks we use. And the reason I'm touching on this is uh, for those of you out there who maybe have heard of implement, sorry, implementation science, uh, but haven't maybe haven't uh, gotten to see it uh, used in, um, in different projects. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through this research question or this, this agenda um, as we put it into an implementation science lens. And this is not to make you an expert, but just to really give you a flavor of it. So just to briefly explain the framework, uh, you start with an evidence-based practice over on the left. Uh, so this might be something that we know works. So statins for reducing cholesterol, uh, but people aren't using it. Why isn't every patient on this, even, uh, even though we know that the science is there? Um, so you come up with some sort of uh, intervention package. Uh, maybe it's an educational component, and then you have an implementation strategy around that. So you might do educational sessions for uh, clinicians. You might have a best practice advisory alert that pops up on the computer. Uh, and I'm sure the clinicians in the room have seen a million of those. Um, and so you have some sort of implementation strategy. Uh, now you're hoping that that does something. And so over on the outcome side, you can look at uh, what are the various outcomes related to that. So there's implementation outcomes, uh, things like, was it even feasible to put forth this effort? Uh, was it acceptable to the people you were um, trying to influence? What was the uptake? What were costs associated with it? Service outcomes, uh, effectiveness, I think should be listed at the top. Was it effective? Did it actually do what you intended it to do? Patient centeredness, timeliness, and then client outcomes. Uh, the client can change in one project. It, it could be the physicians and another, the nurses or the patients. Uh, so what was their level of satisfaction? For patients, how did their symptomatology change? How did their functional status change? So that's the framework. To put it into this project, we actually did not have real world evidence that telemedicine uh, could improve uh, or reduce uh, infections. We didn't have evidence, real world evidence as an, for it to be used as an infection control measure. Um, and so we were sort of tasked with doing that uh, but we also were interested in these other things. Uh, we were less interested in aspects of the implementation strategy, but just for your background, uh, as they rolled out this in, uh, acute care telemedicine, uh, they had local technical support. Uh, they had, I think the nurses, uh, and this is particular for, per particularly for the inpatient setting. Um, I think the nurses really acted as champions um, and they were kind of the local knowledge experts um, in the technology. And then they also provided educational materials uh, for that. And then what were we interested in? Well, that first paper I just described really showed, okay, this is feasible uh, and people are using it. And that's all we did with that first paper. And we were interested in chasing some of these other outcomes with this next uh, suite of uh, papers, which was uh, looking at acceptability for the various stakeholders looking at safety, effectiveness, and then uh, patient-centeredness. Uh, and so these are the things we're chasing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sam to talk about uh, the quantitative aspects of our evaluation. Thank you, Stacey. So as uh, was previously mentioned, um, our, we, for our quantitative evaluation, we use the real-time locating system that is installed throughout 300 and 500 P to really capture how clinician and nursing movement changed uh, in response to telemedicine, but in the context of the larger pandemic and all the issues that brought. 
So, uh, the RTLS system is based on uh, or relies on the badges worn on name tags and sensors in various locations throughout the hospital, including patient rooms, which was of interest here. Um, here we extracted the data, de-identified the data. Um, as we know that this is very sensitive data, people are being tracked throughout their workday. Um, and then on top of that, limited this data to evaluate just the movement of clinicians and nurses into patient rooms. Um, so there's other uh, data points, um, for example, a hallway or uh, storage closets also could have sensors, but we limit this evaluation for patient rooms to keep the privacy and really uh, control the scope. Um, so using this data, we were able to calculate the number of physical entrances into patient rooms. So a proxy for uh, PPE use and duration of these interactions to get an idea of how the workload or workflow may have changed at each one of these entrances. Next slide, please. So this uh, RTLS data was used in our next two evaluations, uh, one in the ED and one with nurses in the inpatient setting. Uh, first, we'll cover uh, the ED uh, study looking at the impact of telemedicine on clinician and nurse movement in the setting. Next slide, please. Um, so here uh, is the patient. Uh, the staff and the physicians and just the number of events included in our study. Um, this study took place pre-implementation, which you can think of right before uh, the shelter-in-place orders um, were put in place within San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Um, this period, what we did have Jabber with the e within the ED. Um, however, post-implementation, this access to telemedicine was expanded by including Zoom, adding additional hardware um, into the ED to uh, support telemedicine. Um, post-implementation occurred um, two weeks about after those initial stay-at-home orders, so we had a washout period uh, within there to uh, remove that initial response. Um, so within this total of eight week evaluation, we were able to capture almost 7,000 patients that were uh, went into the ED, about 40% were tested for COVID. Uh, during this time, we were able to capture uh, about 200 nurses and 50 physicians. Uh, nurses uh, were the L RTLS badges at a higher rate than uh, physicians, so they are overrepresented in the data. And then lastly, uh, we were able to capture 16,000 RTLS events, so 16,000 uh, different entrances into patients' rooms um, that were related to COVID-19 uh, tested patients. So again, subsample, but just to show the volume of data we were able to look at within two weeks to inform our study. And then uh, telemedicine, as, as mentioned, we had Jabber, uh, but we were looking at 0.6 calls per patient while, during their ED stay, um, as compared to 1.3 calls per patient uh, after Zoom and the hardware was pushed out. Next slide, please. So to look at encounters that proxy for PPE use first um, and how that changed pre-post implementation, we found that the number of physical encounters per patient in the ED did not differ pre and post implementation uh, with the blue being nurses showing a slight but not significant uptick in encounters. So that could be translated to additional PPE, but it's hard uh, uh, based on this short-term study, and there was lots of other factors going on uh, as listed at the bottom of this graph, such as the uh, creation of the rapid uh, PCR tests available, as well as uh, protocols getting implemented, uh, people getting used to those protocols as the pandemic went on. 
but within the short term, we saw no change in the number of physical encounters. Next slide, please. But how did this impact duration of a nurse, clinician or nurse to patient interaction? Uh, in the light blue, we looked at the cumulative interaction per patient uh, in minutes um, for the ED stay uh, pre-post. We saw no differences in the amount of time nurses were interacting with patients, um, no difference between the amount of time physicians were interacting with patients. We did see that uptake in telemedicine care provided, the so 12 minutes provided with the availability of Zoom and the additional hardware compared to four minutes pre-pandemic. Um, and then overall, um, I think this is very positive. Uh, total duration um, of care provided to patients while well, in the ED did not differ pre-implementation to post-implementation space. So it kind of exactly what we are uh, exactly opposite of what we might have hypothesized with that additional uh, telehealth or telemedicine care. However, remembering back to the context of those early pandemic stages and the uncertainty, um, I think it's a positive finding that we are providing a total, total, similar total level of care to these patients in the ED. Next slide, please. Um, so key messages uh, from um, this study was, we saw no changes uh, in the number of entrances, duration, total room, or total duration of care provided. Um, however, this is study inspired our next study, as in we saw that nurses had the most interaction with patients with 81% of entrances and 85% of time. This could be due to the fact that more or larger proportion of nurses wore the LTS badges, but we also know um, based on uh, typical workflows and previous research that nurses provide um, most in-person per in care to patients in the hospital setting. Um, and it is super important for safety reasons uh, for that in uh, increased in-person care. So we saw nursing workflows may be the most impacted by telemedicine during the long-term or in other settings, and this was worth evaluation. Next slide, please which leads to the second uh, quantitative study of the series of work, which looked at nursing in the inpatient setting. Next slide, please. Um, so our aim here was to compare the primary COVID-19 unit to four comparison units using the RTLS data. Um, the four comparison units were uh, the same physical uh, layout as the COVID-19 unit, but we do recognize that there was differences in types of patients, nurses ratios, but we tried to balance uh, those limitations as much as possible in this study. Um, here, in regards to telemedicine, uh, the COVID-19 unit almost immediately uh, had telemedicine hardware installed in each room where the comparison units generally shared their hardware, uh, so had a limited set uh, number of uh, iPads, say, on the unit and had to pass them around um, to pa different patient rooms, depending on what patients need. Um, so there's a little more setup involved um, for each patient on those comparison units. Um, data uh, was captured between January 6th uh, to December 27th, 2020. So this captured some of that pre-pandemic baseline period, along with the telemedicine rollout and um, the first and second surge of the pandemic, with, along with those non-surge periods that occurred in between. So a lot more data here to look at how telemedicine perhaps impacted nursing movement, but again, recognizing that there's many confounding variables. However, next, we'll go to the next slide. Um, and so first, uh, in the blue, uh, this is the co uh, adoption of Zoom. So number of Zoom calls uh, per patient. And we can see the COVID unit rapidly adopted telemedicine 
um, starting very early on in uh, the telemedicine, ro telemedicine rollout period and early pandemic. Whereas our four comparison units, so we didn't see that uptake until the end of that huge surge in late 2020. We were not able to link this uh, Zoom uh, data to particular patients or particular nurses or physicians. So this is just kind of overall how many telemedicine calls were occurring during this period um, to give context to the RTLS data, which is depicted in uh, the red line for the AM shift and the black line for the PM shift. And for both of these shifts, we found that the number of room entrances decreased as compared to baseline for the COVID-19 units, but not the comparison units. So looking at the top graph, we see that uh, the number of entrances uh, throughout the pandemic, so telemedicine rollout phase and beyond, uh, is lower than pre-pandemic levels for the COVID-19 uh, units, where we did not see as dramatic or a decrease at all in those comparison units. Furthermore, we saw that uh, this decrease was most pronounced during the telemedicine rollout surge one and surge two phases, whereas encounters upticked a little bit in the non-surge phases, um, really showing uh, changes in uh, nursing workflows uh, depending on the stage of the pandemic. And it also kind of flows with uh, the uptick and downtick in the Zoom utilization, but again, not connected. Uh, next slide. So how did this work with, uh, or how did these changes in number of counters uh, go with uh, how long nurses spent in each encounter? And we saw that the duration uh, spent in room per encounter uh, compared to baseline, it increased for the COVID-19 unit, but not the comparison unit. Um, so as nurses were entering patient rooms less frequently uh, in the pandemic period, we saw an increase in the amount of time spent in each of those encounters uh, in the primary COVID unit, whereas the comparison unit saw no change throughout the pandemic. Um, here, we also see that this change is more pronounced in that telemedicine rollout period and the surge periods. Um, so these really suggest that uh, the two, this graph with the previous graph really suggests that nurses are batching their work and perhaps reducing PPE use um, during this time. But how does this uh, impact total time spent with patients? As Stacy mentioned, it's uh, important for patient safety. And overall, we found that uh, total time nurses spent with patients did not significantly differ uh, between the COVID and comparison units, except during that telemedicine rollout phase. Um, so looking at this as, uh, positive. Uh, we were excited to find this, that patients were being provided a similar amount of in-person care in the pandemic. Uh, the rebatching of workflows um, was effective and maintained uh, in-person um, contact with patients um, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. The key message from this study um, is direct nurse patient encounters in COVID-19 unit decreased in frequency and increased in duration compared to pre-pandemic levels. And total bedside time at bedside was not impacted. This potentially reduces PPE use and risk of infection, although not directly measured. Um, However, if you're entering the patient rooms less frequently, we I think it's a pretty, uh, easy to assume that PPEs is probably also um, reduced during this time. This work, uh, the past two studies, uh, build on previous work at our institution using RTLS dat data. And I provided two citations here, but this data can be used to capture meaningful workflow uh, changes um, at Stanford. 
And then finally, a redistribution of work and telemedicine adoption in this inpatient study suggests that telemedicine is used to complement direct patient care, not replace it, um, which Stacy will further explore in the qualitative work done, with, done for this project. Great. So uh, switching over to the qualitative aspect. Uh, so uh, we really wanted to get in there and ask people, hey, how is this impacting you? And we did just that. Uh, this first study, uh, uh, Nadia Safanelli led, um, she's now at Berkeley. Uh, we talked to nurses, attending physicians, and residents uh, who were had patients on the M7 unit. Um, which was our, our COVID-19 predominant unit at the time. Uh, we found that adoption by all clinical roles, uh, sorry, so there was adoption by all clinical roles uh, and this nurses, these, they batched the in-work, the in-person work to save PPE, uh, which really valid, validated the quantitative findings that Sam just described. Uh, so nurses were not only doing their own assessments, uh, they were also doing basically the in-person components of other jobs. So respiratory therapy, occupational therapy um, was asking them to do certain components of that. They were bringing in the food trays. They were uh, doing house maintenance and, and cleanup. Uh, and so they their roles expanded and it meant that they were spending more time in the room, uh, but, but fewer entrances um, to save that PPE. Uh, clinicians were overall very enthusiastic about the technology, uh, given the safety benefits. Uh, physicians in particular uh, talked about uh, save, uh, time saved uh, from walking between units, because they could call out from a, they could call out to multiple patients from a single location. There were no perceived alterations to patient safety, uh, but the nurses did note that uh, they felt an increased responsibility to really capture great assessments uh, because a lot of times the clinical team really was relying on that nursing assessment to see if there were uh, clinical changes with the patient. Uh, the technical burden of connection, uh, unfortunately, fell disproportionately on the nurses. Uh, there were some interruptions uh, that they described. And then the residents, a uh, few residents did mention that they missed physical exam opportunities because they weren't going into the room uh, to do that physical exam. And I'll just mention that uh, the various different clinical teams, uh, there was usually one clinician that physically went into the room. Um, they certainly went in at least once a day, um, whether that was this, the senior resident, I think both the senior resident and the attending um, would go in, but then oftentimes the junior residents uh, were, were rounding virtually instead of going in the room, as opposed to what typically happens, which is everybody shuffles into the room they do the rounding at that point and then everyone shuffles out. Um, so that was that missed opportunity. Uh, just to hear directly from them, an attending physician said on the left, uh, I think from a comfort standpoint, there's always a concern of going into uh, a room with a patient and getting infected, particularly if you wanna check on them multiple times. So this uh, technology is extremely useful and valuable. A nurse said on the flip side, it kind of became a role. We have to be there to facilitate these Zoom conferences. Uh, it's a little time consuming to coordinate. Oh, how, uh, can you help me show, can you show me how to Zoom? Even though we have clear instructions in each of the Zoom rooms. A resident says, uh, so when I was on the wards, I never went physically in the rooms with any of these patients. And in that way, I think it's detrimental. You don't get a lot of teaching about the physical exam that you probably wanted. So it was great to have these perspectives, uh, but we were really missing the patient perspective. And at the time when we did those clinician interviews in uh, July and into the fall of 2020, um, it, it was just still too early. It was, it was really hard to, to get in to see, um, not physically see, but at least talk to those uh, patients experiencing the technology. Uh, but the following year, we were able to do that. Um, and I give a lot of credit to Lisa Shea and her students um, for really pu pushing this forward through the um, Stanford Healthcare Consulting Group. Uh, so that team conducted 19 semi-structured interviews with patients who were currently admitted on the M7 unit with COVID-19. Uh, we worked with the nurses to make sure that the patient was stable and, and not undergoing any kind of treatment um, And at that time. And then we would call into their room 
uh, directly. Uh, we found that overall patients accepted inpatient telemedicine. Uh, they understood the need for isolation precautions, but that they did have this preference for in-person care where possible. Uh, the quality of care was believed to be similar, and they also liked the frequent touch points uh, that seemed to reduce anxiety for patients. Uh, a few patients did miss having a daily examination uh, with a stethoscope in particular, uh, and then there were ongoing challenges, uh, including low audio volume, uh, not having a regular uh, place for the tablet within the room, and uh, inconsistent verbal introductions from the clinical team, uh, among others. Hearing directly from the patients they shared on the, on the left side, uh, it's helpful that I can talk to multiple doctors without having to expose them to COVID. Uh, so they understood what was going on in most cases. I think it's great because we have more contact with the medical providers than any other time. You normally have to wait until they come to you and talk to you. And then on the flip side, most of the time when we see doctors, uh, they use a stethoscope to listen to the heart and lungs. That's the normal way to see a patient. So I wonder, I'm okay with the tablet, but the nurse never uses a stethoscope to listen to my lungs. So that is something I'm not comfortable with. And finally, uh, regretting kind of the, the lack of in-person communication uh, the one patient shared, I'm here, but I don't see your whole body and vice versa. It sort of changes one's mood. Uh, so from uh, these interviews, we were able to generate um, a set of recommendations uh, just to call out a few, simply getting the audio volume louder. Uh, they were using the tablets at that time, but uh, we needed to improve the uh, microphone side on the provider side uh, and improve the speaker side on the patient the patient side, and I know the team has been working on that. Um, an announcement, so this is back to that patient privacy issue. Uh, sometimes the tablet would just turn on, so they were missing that digital knock-knock feature. Um, so could we uh, build that into a call? Um, and those are just a simple few of the technical ones. Uh, from the use perspective, how does the care team use this technology can we bring back that stethoscope into the exam room, even if it's uh, the nursing team doing that, even better the physician, um, because patients are missing that. Uh, and then really getting the clinical team to introduce themselves verbally with each encounter. Uh, one patient described looking at a team of, you know, six to eight people on the Zoom, and then they would hear another voice and nobody's lips were moving. And so then they realized there were even more people in the room that they actually couldn't see on the camera, and that was uh, somewhat bewildering to them. Okay, so we just presented a lot of data, but let's just try to answer this question based on what we just presented. Uh, did it work? Mostly, but it depends on setting and outcome. Most things in research you're gonna get back and it's, it's gonna be some sort of shade of gray. So this is a little bit of shade of gray, uh, but at least we're gonna give you mostly. So, so yes, this is worth pursuing overall. Uh, so thinking about the intended effects, did it reduce infections? Did it reduce PPE? I think we can say in the inpatient, inpatient setting that yes, uh, nurses went into the room less frequently. Uh, based on some assumptions that are outlined in the paper, we estimate this saved uh, nearly 800 PPE units per week um, in that unit. And uh, we did not see that change in workflows in the ED setting for physicians and nurses, uh, but that may have been just because it was so early in the pandemic. Um, and so there's certainly uh, future research that needs to be done there. Uh, was it acceptable uh, to patients in the clinical team? I think, yes, it was acceptable overall. Um, in terms of patient safety, remembering that link between nursing time at the bedside and patient safety, um, we found that overall time at the bedside was unchanged. So I think that's favorable overall. Um, we don't exactly know how less frequent but longer periods of time in the room, um, how that exactly influences patient safety. So that's uh, an area for future work. Uh, going back to that four minutes to dawn, three minutes to doff, uh, using some assumptions, we think that this uh, technology saved an extra 78 and 64 minutes uh, for nurses and the AM and PM shifts, respectively. Um, In-person care was still preferred, um, especially by patients. And there was that room for improvement regarding the technical uh, setup and the care team protocol. Leveling up even higher, what did we learn about this uh, in terms of how we operate as a learning health system? 
Uh, and a few just lessons, um, some things we did well, some things I think we could improve. Um, I think we, uh, to identify the opportunities, we did rely on previously established networks. Um, and I think what was especially helpful was I had connected with a clinical informatics fellow, Birju Katala, that kind of got us uh, off and running on this uh, RTLS data and seeing what we, what we could do with that data. Um, and certainly the, the networks uh, built in through my colleagues at the Evaluation Sciences Unit uh, pulled in other individuals as well. Um, so talk to your colleagues from different training backgrounds people without letters behind their last name, people with letters, people with different letters. Um, we partnered with nurses, the emergency department, and uh, that was really fantastic to have those collaboration, collaborations. Um, talk to your neighbors, uh, Stanford Healthcare, Stanford Children's Health, uh, Santa Clara County all got together um, and shared something. In terms of the evaluation itself, uh, use proxy measures when endpoints are not available. So we use that RTLS location data to really understand uh, as, as a proxy for PPE use and infection, uh, potential infection um, events. Evaluations are resource intensive, so you have to direct resources wisely. So we fortunately had support through ICDP um, over on the SHC side. We had in-kind support from nursing and the ED and also two fellowship programs um, supported uh, the various uh, people's time in this project. And, and so as you're thinking about a learning health system, you really wanna direct evaluation resources to the highest yield projects uh, that are out there. And in the evaluation sciences unit, we like to think of, is there a gap in the literature? Is there an operational benefit? And is it feasible to do this evaluation? And uh, that uh, helps us kind of decide uh, with our partners how, how to direct resources. Another area, I think this could have been an improvement area for us, uh, was that researchers needed to join operational meetings periodically to both monitor how the changes uh, in the clinical environment are impacting the evaluation, um, but then also share data to inform change. Um, and I think we, uh, we were certainly in touch with the operators uh, throughout. This is a period of two years that this work was taking place now. Um, but we, we didn't sit in regularly on the meetings. Um, and that is, I think, a function of the incentives and how the incentives are aligned for uh, researchers and budding researchers versus operators. We really have two different things we're working towards um, in terms of operators looking at uh, the, the safety outcomes, operational outcomes um, at the, bo the bottom line, um, and then researchers kind of more focused on uh, those academic products and disseminating the knowledge. So did we, combine science, informatics, incentives, and culture. I think we certainly did well uh, with informatics, pulled in the science. Uh, I think that the incentives uh, still need to be better aligned, um, but I'm, I'm curious people's uh, take on that. And then culture, I mean, uh, talks like this, I think SMCI um, and the work that we're doing uh, just really helps to build the culture of people starting to think in, in this way. So. Um, all of this is certainly a work in progress. So we are going onward and upward and uh, we'll wrap it up with that and um, open it up for uh, questions and discussion. Well, thank you, Stacy and Sam. That, that was incredible, you know, that you were able to do this in such a timely manner and get such, you know, detailed data in many ways. Um, you know, that's very impressive how quickly you're able to get this evaluation going. Um, and I'm looking for, if people want to speak up, feel free now or raise your hand. Um, also, I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any questions yet in the chat. I do have some general, I have specific questions, but maybe not spend time on that. Maybe general question. You know, you talk about embedded research. Um, and then there's the issue of, well, does that, is that truly research? Does that need an IRB approval? Um, is, it, are you ta is this like um, embedded evaluations that can be done you know, by the health system and should be done by the health system? Or, or, or are these things that, uh, that are truly considered research and, and, need, uh, and need IRB approval? Yeah, I, um, I, I wish I could have done certain things and say, I probably used the word research when I should have been saying evaluation. Um, but all of this work was under a non-research determination. So we, uh, everything was reviewed by the IRB um, and determined to be quality improvement. 
And uh, so it was uh, not research with a capital R, as we say. Um, and so, you know, you can think of it as embedded evaluation. Um, the, the primary purpose being to improve the health system. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I was also struck by the, the, the detail and the extent of the locator system service. I know we sort of actually, other systems have actually, the, the staff have negotiated to block that by having something at, on your badge holder to prevent it, any low, the system, hospital from trying to locate where you are. You can, it can get you badging in and badging out, but it wouldn't track you in real times. And I was curious, how, how did you know, how could you tell that say um, residents were only wearing their badge 10% of the time and, and other uh, physicians 40% of the time? Sam, do you wanna go for that one? Yes. Um, yeah, this is a close collaboration uh, with HR also, and using the identified data sets and an honest broker to identify the ultimate denominator of who was scheduled for service during that four week period. Um, admittedly, we did uh, do that for the ED study because it was shorter term and that little reduced data set and a little easier to combine those. Um, but a lot, we're going at the IRB uh, conversation too. That was one of the things we had to do, uh, really limit the scope of the project, make sure everything's de-identified and high uh, lens towards privacy of this information to do that, to determine those numbers. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... I think we have a comment and question here from Neil. Neil, why don't you, um, you, you can speak out if you want and-, and, and Sure, uh, um, Stacy and Sam, that was a great talk. Um, and I've been lucky to work with you both uh, through the ESU and it was awesome to see something else that you guys have worked on. Um, but I, I really love your idea for trying to in, you know, encourage embedded research um, as Paul was commenting on. Um, what advice do you have for teams that are designing interventions right now that want to have an eye towards doing rigorous evaluations of those interventions based on this experience that you've had doing this awesome work? I, I can start. Uh, I think going back to that, that bubble diagram uh, that I talked about in the beginning, I think so much of it uh, happens just at the outset in terms of finding that comparator group. And so if rather than just rolling out an intervention to everybody, if you can just take a step and think about, okay, what is going to be a good comparison? If we were doing a clinical trial, um, what could be a good comparison for this? And just take even just a little pause. Um, and then it might bring you to this place of, oh, well, we don't actually have to roll it out to everybody all at once. We could actually start it in these two clinics and let a month go by, and then we could roll it out to these two clinics and then let a month go by. And then um, what I'm describing is essentially a step wedge is just one example. Um, but just spending a little bit of time uh, understanding uh, clinical research design, just those like basic principles how to uh, around how to design studies and evaluations um, can take you a long way. And along with that, to shamelessly promote the ESU, but we do have uh, options as outlined on our website for brief consultations. And we love being involved in the early process to help teams think through how to, the timing to roll it out, the best comparison group to set up an evaluation so you can ultimately make some type of conclusion um, on. So yes, please reach out for any improvement efforts that you may need help thinking through some of those questions and design uh, implementation decisions you make. Yeah, I think that's a great thing for SMCI in general to say, you know, obviously you guys are somewhat of a limited resource, not we can't have every unit just calling you up and asking for your advice. Um, and not, but I, I realize you're encouraging it at this point, but is there, um, and, and maybe 
and maybe you have this, but some type of um, how to guide to do say a stepped wedge <laughs> type of thing where you do have the option of multiple units to roll things out and let people try to do it on their own to the extent they feel you know they can handle it. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times this <laughs> has come up, Paul, in my, my time uh, in the last, having been back at Stanford in the last four years. And let me tell you, it's in, in progress. Uh, we are, we're thinking and thinking about that how-to guide. Uh, but in the meantime, certainly yeah. reach out. Um, and SMCI has resources on its website as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, I want to, I think we'll close here. I want to thank both of you, Sam and Stacy, showing what great work ESU is doing and particularly the two of you in this project. I think this was a fantastic example. I'm um, just, I think the type of work we were like, I like to see um, at our SS, SMCI uh, lectures. So thanks everyone again, and um, we'll be in touch with the next with the next time uh, next meeting. Hope to see you then. Great, thank you, Paul. So long. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.